of Western Europe. Well, thank you. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the Shanghai Archaeology Forum for their invitation to this meeting and also for organizing a meeting with such a, a broad global perspective on archaeological research. Um, I'm going to cross the Atlantic now from North America to Western Europe. Uh, my contribution to uh, the uh, theme of globalization is in fact to revert to some of the issues that we were talking about yesterday. Um, that is to say how power is exercised in less centralized societies. And I'll also be talking about something else which we heard a little about yesterday, which is uh, megalithic monuments. Uh, we heard about some megalithic monuments of Northern Europe yesterday and their social connotations. Uh, my area is Western Europe, Atlantic Europe, which has monuments of a similar but somewhat different type uh, on which I will be basing slightly different uh, kinds of uh, discussion. But first of all, to introduce my subject, uh, I want to take two contrasting examples from very different parts of the world. So the first of these, Monuments um, have been constructed uh, from the early part of the Holocene or from the late Paleolithic. And this is one of the earliest uh, burial mounds of which I'm aware, at a place called lens in, uh, western, in eastern Canada, uh, on the east coast of Canada, which is a simple pit uh, lined with stone slabs uh, containing a single individual um, under a mound of blocks about eight meters across, um, and what is interesting, of course, is to uh, try to understand what the selection of the individual who was chosen for this rather special kind of burial might have been based upon. And what we can see here is that the burial is rather unusually placed uh, face down and has a stone block placed on the, the back, on his back, which you may be able to see if you look closely at this diagram. So this is somebody who has been selected for a particular kind of burial. Uh, the monument itself is only eight meters across, so is relatively modest in its dimensions. At the other end of the scale are burial mounds such as the Kofun uh, keyhole tombs of Japan, uh, including this, which is the largest of all, the Dyson keyhole tomb, uh, which measures uh, almost 500 meters in length, or even more if you include its three encircling moats and uh, the tomb itself reaches a height of 35 meters. Uh, we don't know exactly who is buried in it, but uh, th this is a whole series of these uh, large mounds, and they are clearly the burial places of the early rulers of the Japanese state. This one dates to the fifth uh, century AD. Interestingly, uh, the burial is not below the mound, it's actually raised on the, central, on the top of the central uh, circular part of the, of the mound that you see there. Um, the Japanese mounds belong to a period, the large mounds I should say, belong to a period of around two centuries as the Japanese state was becoming consolidated. And once it became consolidated, uh, there was the introduction of Buddhism in the 7th century and uh, large mounds no longer were built. And uh, this idea that large monuments may sometimes be involved with the establishment of power, and once that power is established, large monuments may no longer be required, is something which uh, may have wider relevance. Now, to my, my subject, as I say, is European, is West megalithic, West European, uh, sorry, megalithic tombs. And of course, within that is the term megalithic. So these tombs are built of large stone blocks, oversized blocks, you might say. They're found uh, throughout Northern and Western Europe. Um, the ones I'm going to be mainly talking about are in Atlantic France. Now, the use of megalithic blocks, these very large stone slabs, uh, in itself seems to convey uh, an expression of power, the ability to bring a labor force together sufficient to quarry these stones, to drag them, not always very great distances, and to raise them into position. Uh, the site you see here is a classic image, but in fact would originally have been concealed beneath a mound. Although, of course, while the structure was being built, the size of the stone would have been very visible to everybody. 
And it may be that only particularly powerful lineages were capable of building very large tombs like this. Uh, there are other features of megalithic architecture, which I'm not really going to talk about, but that is to say that they're not um, haphazardly chosen stones. The stones used were carefully selected. In this case, you see uh, a pink uh, limestone uh, upright used sandstone. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Sorry, let me start again. It's got an igneous capstone, which is gray, and the uprights are of reddish limestone and sandstone. Uh, making a color contrast and also perhaps a contrast in symbolism uh, between the places from which these stones had been derived. Uh, most of these stones come from relatively local distances. Sometimes they come from further away, suggesting that the places from which the stones came were symbolically important. So what do these monuments tell us about social relations and social change among Neolithic societies in the fifth and fourth millennia BC. And to explore this, I'm going to give you three uh, brief case studies from my own main area of research in Western France. Now, um, there are a number of tombs here, not so many as we saw yesterday in Northern Europe, but uh, some of them are of considerable uh, dimensions. The first example I'm going to look at is this area, this famous area, uh, the Karnak area of southern Brittany, which you see outlined in red there. Uh, this area contains megalithic monuments that are not only uh, burial chambers between beneath sometimes impressive mounds, but also unusually large standing stones. So the largest of all, the largest prehistoric standing stone in Europe is no longer standing, as you see here. Um, that is the, the, in French, is known as the Grand Menier Brise, the great broken monolith, uh, which would have weighed, when it was intact, 330 tons and would have stood 20 meters high. Uh, it is an enormous stone and stands apparently right at the beginning of the megalithic sequence. We don't know quite how old it is because we only have a terminus uh, antiquem which is given us by the surface onto which it collapsed, it fell. And it wasn't alone. In fact, as you'll see here, if you look at the line of red marks here, um, the, this great uh, uh, broken menhir, in fact, was one of 19 stones which formed a, a stone row, an alignment of standing stones, and included at least one other stone which weighed over 70 tons and a hypothetical reconstruction of the stone row when it was, in, when it was intact is given uh, up at the top right. In the same area, there are standing stones which form a different kind of monument. These are these large stone rows which consist of parallel lines of stones. Uh, which can extend one kilometer or more over the landscape and consist of uh, 10 or 11 lines of stones. The largest of all um, is the stone row of Kerzero, which extends 2.1 kilometers over the landscape. Um, this, this, is one of the, this is the second largest, extending 1.1. The very largest extends twice as long, 2.1 kilometers, and contains even more stones, 1,129 stones, and some of those weigh over 20 tons. Now, associated with them, although not necessarily exactly contemporary, are a series of very large burial mounds. There are only six or seven of these, as a map at the bottom right, showing you that there are only six or seven very large mounds, uh, one of the largest, perhaps the largest of all, being this Tumulus de Saint Michel, uh, the uh, big mound there with a later chapel, a 17th century chapel built on its surface. And so large is the mound that the chapel only occupies a small area of the surface. Now, at the heart of this monument is a relatively small megalithic chamber, measuring only about two meters. 2.4 meters by 1.8 meters across. Um, so it's a relatively small structure, and the mound that covers it, which is now measuring 120 meters long, 
did not achieve that form in a single step. It was built in a series of stages um, over po possibly as many as two or three centuries. But these are very, very large structures indeed, but very, very small burial spaces. Within these chambers, uh, the Tumulus of Saint Michel, a small burial chamber, has uh, 39 polished stone axes and 136 varicite beads. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got a photo of a varicite bead, but they appear in colour very like the turquoise uh, materials we've seen in some of the previous uh, presentations. Among the axes, uh, these are axes, in fact, from another of the Karnak mounds. Among these axes are several of a material called jadeite, a sort of jade variant, which comes from the Alps, a distance of 600 kilometers away. And as you see on the right, these, contain, these uh, jadeite, jadeite objects include not only axes, which are very, very finely formed and very finely polished, but also uh, armlets or stone rings. The varicite beads, which I also mentioned, these greenstone beads, come from even further away, from a thousand kilometers away. So it's really, it's really uh, very much the image of um, uh, large mounds, large standing stones, and exotic items coming from a distance, which seems to indicate the presence of what might be um, a, a society which is no longer so equal, which perhaps has leading elites or leading lineages who are beginning to exercise power and have the ability to attract materials from a long distance and to attract large labor forces to construct their monuments. Now that is followed around 4200 BC, there is a major change. That's the period at which the Grand Menia Brise, that very large stone, collapsed. And what is thought to have happened is that an earthquake caused the collapse of the stone, uh, which then fractured, and all the other standing stones near it were then taken down. And these large burial mounds no longer are built in the dimensions that they were built before. And instead, we have a new type of chambered tomb, a new type of tomb, which contains a smaller, it's still quite large, but a smaller chamber, but this time accessed by a passage, allowing successive burials to be brought into the chamber. In Brittany, we don't have uh, preserved human remains very regularly, so we cannot tell exactly what the practice was, but these tombs are found very generally in northern and western France, and uh, contain typically around 10, 12, or 15 individuals. So they are um, containing groups of people, not single inhumations, which is what we thought the big tombs previously contained, but um, they are not large numbers of people nonetheless. And they have no associated, significant associated burial goods. So we have um, the first phase, which is the large standing stone, some of them decorated, large burial mounds, exotic traded items, stone rows, which may equate with the rise of dominant lineages or individuals, followed around 4200 BC by a period of destruction. The, the great, the broken stone falls after an earthquake. The other stones of its kind are pulled over, possibly because of a great ritual or uh, perhaps ritual power has been undermined by this natural event, the earthquake. Uh, in their place appear a new tradition of collective burials, which involve fairly large monuments, but larger numbers of people, and no longer including these exotic um, imported special materials of jadeite and varicite. And then finally, after a small gap, uh, about a millennium later, a few hundred years later at least, we have a new type of tomb appears. These are called gallery graves. In these cases, we have uh, lo potentially large numbers of burials, um, and again, without individual grave goods. Now, once again, in Brittany, we don't have preserved human remains, but these also are found in other regions. And uh, a very good example is this one 
um, to the east of Brittany, where there are the remains of something like 350 individuals, some of them contained in uh, wickerwork baskets or stone boxes in successive layers. So this all suggests uh, one scenario that we might put forward to interpret this would be that there is an increasing democratization of burial. So we have megalithic monuments, the mounds are becoming smaller, the burial spaces are becoming larger, and more and more people are being buried within them. So the right to burial, the, the privilege of burial in one of these tombs is no longer so restricted. And let's go back. Um, a French archaeologist, Jean-Paul de Moule, uh, some while ago, uh, set out this scheme, this uh, model of changing social centralization or social control in France throughout prehistory and into the Roman period. And you see there uh, in this model, the black line shows varying degrees of social control. And uh, you see, I've marked on there where these different kinds of tomb base stand. And his idea was that you get incipient social hierarchy, which is often followed by a reaction where um, the, the social control is unable to institutionalize itself properly. And so you get a reversion to a more collective and more communal kind of social behavior. Now, one of the problems with uh, the evidence I've just talked about is that, uh, as I've mentioned, it's about burial, but there are no surviving burials in this particular region because the soil is granitic, it's acidic. So what I now wanted to do is to look at an area immediately to the south of this area, and this is an area where I've done my own field work, and look at two sites where we do have preserved skeletal material within these burial mounds. And the first, the first of these is an area, is an area of Western France, uh, as you see there, and the ring, the red ring, is marking the location of a site called Bougon. And Bougon is not a single monument, but a group of monuments forming a small cemetery of megalithic tombs. And uh, here is an aerial view and a plan, and you see it consists of five burial mounds, which are lettered A, B, C, D, in fact, D is, sorry, is missing. A, B, C, E, and F. D was there, but it is a medieval feature. And we can see from that, we have two very large mounds. That's A and C. And C, in fact, has a small burial space, um, but a very large burial platform added onto the end. And uh, F, which in fact grows, from a small chamber at one end uh, to a linear monument to which then is added another larger chamber at the other end. And what it seems is happening is that the monuments are growing larger through time, but the burial spaces are not. And if we then turn to what the burial evidence shows us at Bougon, we can see that these chambers have, for the most part, relatively small numbers of individuals. So four or 16 in some cases, 14, 16. Uh, a, at the left-hand side with 180, should be disregarded since that is undoubtedly a later deposit. So small numbers of people, large monuments, monuments which are 80 meters, 60 meters in size, uh, small burial chambers, small numbers of people. We looked in detail at one of these chambers, uh, this is F0, at the burial deposits, and here we've had the benefit recently of a study of ancient DNA by Olivia Cherenay and uh, Ron Pinhasi from the University of Vienna, and that has shown us that within that particular chamber, within that burial deposit, there are indeed three siblings one possible cousin, and uh, at a layer just above, a grandparent. And that very much reinforces the idea that these are indeed, uh, these are indeed family tombs. So that we are in fact having elite lineages who are building these, these monuments. And that should be born against uh, in comparison with the evidence we have for the construction where we know from uh, examples like this, this was an experiment carried out in 1979 
where one of these capstones from one of these chambers weighing 32 tons, a replica was made of concrete and uh, was pulled across this trackway, and here it is, and it required 200 people to move it. So we have 200 people perhaps pulling these capstones, but the burial spaces which they, um, which they cover contain the remains of only perhaps five or 10 individuals. Now, just briefly, just to, to bring this to a close, really, I just want to show you another example where we have done a more systematic excavation of one monument, and this is a Prix de la Charrière. This is the same period, and the same principle applies. So here we have a, a, a long mound uh, with um, a dry stone structure, a complex honeycomb of dry stone structures. And within it, there are three burial spaces. So, sorry. So you see, it's actually a two phase monument, green, in fact, three phases purple, green, and uh, then the uh, yellow. Uh, and I'll show you first the purple monument, then I'll show you the burial spaces further to the east. So it begins with this uh, small chamber within uh, a circular surround of stones, which contains only three individuals. So a very modest beginning. That then is incorporated in the top there within a longer mound, which has a rock cut ditch completely encircling it. And then freestanding a little bit to the east is a second burial chamber in a circular surround. In phase two, all that is encapsulated within this much more massive long mound. And what, of course, is interesting from this is that the long mound, this 100 meter long mound, is much larger than is needed simply to cover the burial spaces. So these are a bit out of place, but they're the, the burial spaces. And we were very lucky that one of those spaces had been intact and had not been touched since uh, 4200 or 4300 BC when it was last uh, occupied or last uh, used, I should say. Um, and uh, it contained a, a burial deposit of around eight individuals, a stone slab floor, um, an incense burner in the corner, you can see perhaps top left, um, but remains of only eight individuals and uh, a ritual ceramics incense burner, but no personal grave goods. So the, the message from this is undoubtedly that there are collective burials in the chambers, but no grave goods, um, and there is nothing to mark the status of separate individuals in the way the burials themselves are equipped. But there are very few individuals in a very large monument. So burial must be being reserved for particular families or individuals. Uh, here, however, at, at this particular site, although the monument is large, I should say there are no large elements in individual stone elements. The largest element is this megalithic slab weighing two tons. Nonetheless, the scale of the monument definitely implies that this uh, is a statement of power not just a place of, of burial for uh, the ordinary population, as it were. And I've tried to look at that question about the overall place of these uh, mounded burials within uh, the overall population of the Neolithic period. I've looked at that in Britain rather than France uh, in a project which we've called the Invisible Dead Project. And the purpose of this is to produce a database of burials to try and show how the numbers vary through time. And uh, this is just one of the charts on the right hand side. And as you see, the levels go up and down a little bit. And what I would observe is that that bears no relationship whatsoever to the actual changes in population size. That is a reflection of changing visibility of burial. And I think we can never really understand these large monumental burials unless we have some overall understanding or a model which relates them to the burial population as a whole. And a lot of people have remarked, and even uh, in the last uh, day or so here, have remarked in the past how so much of the populations of prehistory and the more recent periods are missing from the burial record. So just to conclude then, we have these monumental expressions of power 
power is conveyed by the overall size of the monuments and the ability to manipulate these large megalithic blocks. There's a disproportion, a disproportion between the size of the labor force required to build the monuments and the, and the size of the buried population. And uh, as I say, I think these mounded tombs can only properly be understood in the context of populations as a whole, when we understand what selected part of the population is receiving burial in this way. Um, and it is also clear that for large sectors of the Neolithic population, uh, they are simply, as I said, the invisible dead. We simply cannot see them. And it is very difficult, therefore, to evaluate uh, burial mounds with these limited individuals against the overall society and its uh, burial practices and beliefs. Thank you very much.